Hello, Cardison. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. So I've really enjoyed your book and I want to set it up because I felt the first few sentences were probably some of the most powerful writing for what is about to come and invokes such emotions. Um, and, and, and I read a lot, but I, this, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. So warning, going to sleep on Sunday will cause Monday. Please note that staying awake all night does not prevent Monday. Tried that, didn't work. You're correct. And there is no cure. Now, very powerful. And that says uh, multiple ideas and concepts that, that are going to be present in this book. Number one, that dreaded feeling that we have all come to feel it at one time or another, which rolls into the idea of m- mental models that you've put in this book. And then uh, also, everyone... There's so many books that come out telling you to get out of your job, to run, get it. That relationship isn't working. Get out. That job isn't working for you. Get out. Your family members are giving you a hard time. End it. Uh, However, this takes a different approach. You've gotten your degree. You've worked really hard to get this job. It's time for you to take responsibility and make this job work for you. And I love this. And the, and the reason I love it is be, because I had grown up in a household where Sunday to Monday was an incredibly depressing time. Now, much like AJ's uh, father, my dad worked in a factory. And so it was off on the weekends. Monday started drudgery and the grind again. So it started with his mood and how we felt it over the 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 day of Sunday, how it dampened, how it gotten worse, how things seemed to have darkened. And that mental model of watching my dad begrudgingly have to go to work, trying to escape it, trying to forget about Monday. Well, of course, that was only passed on to me. And I spent a large portion of my teenage years and and my 20s, I'm 46 now, and my 20s, Trying to escape that feeling, the idea of having to get up on Monday morning to go to work, to me, because of how I grew up, seemed like a prison sentence. It seemed like something that you would want to escape. And if if you can avoid that, then you have succeeded. So, of course, in my 20s, I had spent my time, and I, as you can see, the amps and, and, and stuff behind me, I spent my time working in rock and roll clubs and music in North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And during that time, I felt that I had did it because every night, every day that I worked at the club was a weekend evening and I didn't have any, resp- and, I'm, and I made it so that I didn't have responsibility in the model that I was putting so much energy in escaping. So why don't we and lay this out for everyone else? Yes. So the first thing I will say is wherever you go, there you are, which is why escaping fundamentally doesn't go, it doesn't work because you show up. So what I think is so interesting in your story, Johnny, is that you built it so there was, quote, no responsibility. But I would challenge you on that a little bit because you had to show up. You had to support the band or whatever you were doing. But the connection there was you had reframed this concept of work as fun. I'm hanging out. I'm with my friends. This is at a bar. And so you had created a mental framework mm-hmm. that that work worked really well for you. And I also think that given the context of what's going on today, the reality for most of us is we can't escape. There aren't a lot of escape valves for us. So it's about getting really clear on what you can do to make your work work for you so that you can find that fun, that love, and that happiness you want. And certainly worked, but to a certain degree and for a certain amount of time before age and just time and the other things that I wanted to do in my life started to become important. And I had to figure out a way of going about them with still trying to play this, this game in my mind. And it didn't end until I faced that game and re and which come later in your book, which was reframing how I was looking at Mondays. Mm-hmm. 
Why does fear keep so many of us miserable in our jobs and keep us from taking the control that we need of our lives and that re dreaded responsibility that Johnny was talking about? Mm -hmm. So fear keeps you stuck in the known. So our brains don't like the unknown. So we'll stick with the music theme. Think about the, when you hear your favorite song on the radio and the lyrics, you can sing along, everybody's happy. But when there's a new song, your brain's like, I don't know what's next. I can't figure out the pattern. Well, that's one of the problems with fear is that your brain can't figure out what's going to really happen. And our we like to stay stuck in the status quo because it's easy, it's safe, is what we know, but it's also creating you creating a situation for you that doesn't work. And what was your journey to begin reframing this in your own life? Because as the book starts, you were in that exact same position, dreading that Monday oh, morning. <laughs> I did. I, I talk about in the book that I worked for a boss. Um, I, I think I used a not very nice word, but he was a micromanager and he made uh, Steve Carell in the office look great. And it was also the worst job, cold sales calls, trying to fill 10 by 10 booth space for a conference. So I had this jerk and a terrible job and I had to pay my bar bill and rent so I couldn't quit. I didn't think I had any marketable skills. So I had to reframe and look at how can you shape this job? So one, that you can develop some new skills. And two, what I had to step back and look at is what was the purpose of my work? So if I couldn't figure out the meaning and value for myself, the company had been in existence. We actually made money. We were doing something in the world that people saw as valuable. What was it? And what I realized is that most of my clients were female first-time business owners and that this 10 by 10 booth space gave them a very cost-effective way to start their business and reach a targeted audience. That was something I could get up in the morning for, helping those women. I think that's such an important lesson because many of us, when we're in that dreaded position, we just think about ourselves and it becomes overwhelming. And we don't often think about, well, what is the purpose of the company that I work for and who am I actually serving in this role that I'm in? And the other part that the book really points out is our relationship with our boss frames that for us as well. You know, feeling micromanaged, feeling checked in on constantly, all of those movements. Well, it does kind of keep you frozen in that state of fear that I'm going to do something wrong or I'm not going to benefit the team. And of course, that impacts our productivity in the negative. And many bosses don't realize this, of course, and, and they're micromanaging of people. And one of the things that I remember feeling distinctly when I was working in the cancer lab was just feeling underappreciated at work. Mm -hmm. And my boss was very results driven. And if we were missing the mark, we heard about it. When we made the mark, when we got the results, very rarely did we hear about it. It was on to the next piece of work. It was on to the next part of the experiments to get the paper published. And it was very hard for me early on in my career to really get my feet under me and feel confident in my work because all I got was the negative feedback. And and of course, if that's all you're getting, then it's easy for you to look around and say, man, I'm not doing a good job. I'm underperforming. And you point out that there are ways for us to create opportunities for that positive feedback to not just make it the one way negative feedback street that many of us are experiencing. What are some of those strategies that we can use to create that positive feedback loop? Mm hmm. So the first one is to ask for the feedback that you want, right? So if there is a skill you want to develop or if there is a new opportunity and you know that you do have a gap, you've got to ask and be very specific around what it is you want. Give them an example of the type of feedback that you're looking for and make sure that you explain how to deliver it. I call it the CSEE -E feedback formula. And the key here with the ask is it helps you not trigger that social threat response of, uh oh, they're about to tell me how awful I am. Because you've taken control, you've made the ask, and you've not left it open ended. Tell me about how my how I'm doing today. I mean, that's that's setting yourself up for, oh, I don't even want to go down that road. I mean, it just is terrifying. So if you can be really specific. The other thing too is, do you know how you want to be appreciated? I mean, do you know what your 
needs or around recognition? Do you know what you need? Do you just need a thank you? Do you need an affirmation written on the wall? What is it that you actually need? Because you can't get that need met if you aren't clear. Now, I'm not so sure how your PhD researcher would take coming to him saying, hey, you know, an atta, atta boy would be great all, all every now and then. But I do think you can frame it in terms of performance. And when I receive recognition, again, that specific recognition around something I did well, it allows me to replicate that and do it again and continue to elevate my performance. And it could definitely be scary at first asking for that feedback and especially framing it in that way. But it's also really empowering to your boss or your manager because it allows them to see that, hey, there's a lot of effort here. This is someone who wants to grow and improve. Those are all signals as a boss myself that I want to see in the people that work for me because that leads me to believe that they're invested in not only themselves and their growth, but in what everything we're trying to do as a team. So if you're in the audience and you're thinking, man, that'd be a really tough conversation with my boss, I challenge you to push through that discomfort and do it because it's gonna set a new method of communication and it's gonna give your boss some clarity around that feedback that you need to perform well. And many of us don't tell our bosses that. We don't start the job saying, you know, I really need words of affirmation in group meetings, or it'd be great on, you know, a once a week basis if we had a check-in and you told me what I did really well, that'd be fantastic. We never set those ground rules. And then of course, our bosses default to their method of communication and their method of feedback. Mm -hmm. And sadly, that's set <laughs> culturally within the company too. I think something that also needs to be said there is if you're going to be brave enough to ask your boss for the feedback, also there's still two parts to that. You're going to ask and then you're going to get it. And you need to be brave enough to just allow him to unload and tell him and tell you the, what the feedback is and the, and the criticisms and, and listen to it. Because I will tell you from experience, if you ask for the feedback and then you go to disqualify everything that your, your boss says or you make excuses for it, that'll probably be the last time that he gives you any feedback. In fact, uh, you, you might be looking for a job after that. Yes, you, you do want to be open and receptive. That's right, Diane. You've got to be willing to receive, which is why being really intentional and specific about this very narrow, very specific thing <laughs> that you want to know that will make it a little bit easier to digest. And I think a big piece of this is the follow up as well. So you get the feedback, you now have to take action on that feedback. You can't be mm -hmm. soliciting feedback and defaulting into old patterns and habits. You want to then go back and circle back and say, hey, you know, I, I really took that feedback. This is what I did. Have you noticed an improvement? Right. And keeping that clear line of communication. That's what top performers do. The people who are getting promoted, who are moving up the career ladder faster than you, they're communicating and setting that communication channel to get that feedback outside of waiting just for the yearly performance review or the quarterly review that all of us standardly go through. But instead, creating that communication with your boss is going to allow you to leapfrog others who might be doing better than you in their role, but their boss isn't seeing it because they don't have that communication going. That's the inside track. And if you see it, you, you need to be able to take it. It's that real time specific. Don't let the time lag in the moment. It's how you're coached in sports. I mean, I, I ran in college and my coach was honest. I mean, it was constant feedback during our runs because that's how we got better because immediately we could shift and apply. So the other piece of this is to create the opportunity where you can do whatever it is you're trying to improve on, let's say maybe communicate more effectively in a presentation in front of your boss, ask for that feedback immediately after, and then do it again and ask for the feedback again so you can have that real-time feedback. I think this lends itself to something else that you were writing about, where to be building up your self-confidence and a, and a, a culture of, of self-compassion because it isn't easy to take that criticism. And if you're going to be open to it, if you're going to constantly put yourself in a position where you need to learn new things 
open yourself up to some new experiences in order to, to make work a place that you're excited about coming into, you're going to find yourself fumbling or around a lot. It's going to be difficult, but by cultivating some appreciation, some compassion and self-love, it's sort of building your confidence bank so you can take some of those hits because if you're in a challenging role, the hits are, are they're going to be coming. That means you're trying. That means you're moving past your current steady state. And that means you're growing. And I would suggest, and there's really great research showing that that flow state where it's hard enough, but not too easy is the optimal place for us to be where we find that happiness and fulfillment. So yes, you're going to stumble. Yes, you are. And in that you're stretching and growing. And that's where I think you're going to continue to find that intellectual curiosity as well as that inner fulfillment engagement with your work. You know, there was something we discussed a few interviews ago that, that goes really well here. And it was a, a John Gottman had mentioned that for every bad interaction, you need five good ones. So to have this compassion, this self-love and this appreciation for everything that's going on you're going to need to combat the combat that the daily rough and tumble that life brings you uh, just to con to continue moving forward in a with a smile on your face mm -hmm. and i talk about in in the book that it's also hard because your brain has a negativity bias is programmed to look for man i really screwed that up or god i didn't go well and so we have to build that muscle and as you're talking about that self appreciation so Two roses and a thorn. You share two roses and a thorn at the end of your day. Works awesome. Um, I love to have our coaching clients keep some type of visible, tangible symbol of past successes. So when you need to fill that well, you can go and see those. It could be emails. It could be notes, whatever it is. It could be, you know, a signed contract for a great amount of money. But you've got that visible, tangible symbol. And then we all know that gratitude and reflection is a really powerful way to fill that well as well. Absolutely. And, and we talk a lot about just journaling and documenting the process as well, because we often don't see how far we've come. We only see the problems ahead. We don't look back to, you know, well, how was it the first month of my role? And how was it the second year of my role? It's, it's changed so much. And of course, the way business moves, the speed at which it moves, we're, we're constantly forward facing. But it's important, especially if you feel that maybe this hasn't been a great year for you. Take stock of, well, how did last year go and the year before that? And are you still growing those skills? Because unfortunately, and we've discussed this myth many a times on the show, we have this visual in our life that our career is just linear and up. And, <laughs> and that's what we're taught in school. And and yet we've had so many people on the show say, that's not been my experience at all. I wish it was linear enough, but it's not the case. And this year, especially many of us are feeling that long plateau and that endless, how long is this going to last? I'm now working from home. I don't even have all the social components to work and the enjoyment that I would get from interacting with my coworkers. And it has become pretty monotonous for many of us. And that's why we are so encouraged to, to hear you write about journaling just as well, because it's not just for growing your social skills in your career. You should be documenting how far you've come. Absolutely. What went well? What do I want to celebrate? Where's an opportunity for growth? And what is a lesson I want to carry forward? I mean, and that you can do that in two minutes and jot it down really quickly. I would also suggest that, that the most effective leaders are radically self-aware. And this self-awareness does not come by always pushing forward. It's a pause, turn, look at, reflect, connect disparate ideas, see trends, and then you turn around and start leading again. It's very difficult to, I think, really create breakthrough performance if you aren't willing to pause and analyze. I was going to say, while well, you're stuck grinding it out, you're seeing things on Instagram and Facebook of everyone else getting these amazing breaks and these amazing things that are happening. I'm like, why don't I get these breaks? Where is my lucky day? Why am I the one that's always sitting here grinding these things out and beating myself up? It's so important to detach from all those things. And this is why journaling is so important because you're able to then look at your journey, look at your highlights, look where 
uh, your progress is rather than comparing and contrasting to everyone else around you. I think when many of us hear self-awareness, we think, okay, yes, I need to know what all my weaknesses are. But it's also the other side of the coin is your strengths. And you write this, that your strengths are your professional gold. But many of us in our career haven't got that feedback around our strengths. We're unclear of what our strengths are. So how can we excavate our strengths to find that gold to forge ahead? We can drop right back into journaling. So answering some core questions. Think about your best day at work. What was it? What were you doing? Who were you with? When people compliment you, what do they compliment you on? That's a really easy access point. But my favorite way to do it is the task and calendar list analysis. I love this stuff where you get to go and you look at your to-dos and you look at your calendar and you literally just do a gut check. This made me really happy, smiley face or check mark if you don't dig the smiley face. And then this stunk, didn't like it, thumbs down, minus. And then you create a list and you start to look at these love to do activities and ask yourself, does it matter who I do it with? Does it matter when I do it? Does it matter how I do it? And start to pull out from it these core strengths, these core things that you can't not do, you really want to grow and develop. You are going to be so much more effective in your career if you play from your strengths than if you're always trying to shore up your opportunities for growth or your blind spots. This is where we can triple X your performance in half the time, but you've got to know what it is. And the other piece of this strengths, I talk about it as a currency because this is what you bring to your company. Like, this is what you are bringing. It's give and take here. And so you're giving this. So what do you want in return? Absolutely. You can't ask if you don't know. And that's so important to get clarity around that. And many of us, to your exact point, and, and I fall into the same trap, have focused so much on your weaknesses and put all of this time and effort and energy on trying to shore up your weaknesses when a tenth of that effort and energy on your strengths and doubling down is what is going to be that key to the big jumps in your career, not the puttering along and the plateaus that we're feeling. Not to mention working on your weaknesses. That is the recipe for unhappiness, Sunday night scaries, and just work sucks. So that's not what we're here to do. We want to be engaged and happy, and the strengths are going to be the place where you are going to find greater fulfillment. I completely agree. And I I think it's such a valuable exercise, no matter where you are in your career, if you're just starting out or if you're advanced in your career and you're looking to take it to that next level. And having, again, once you've raised that self-awareness, you could bring that into the questions with your boss around your performance and say, you know, I've really identified these strengths in myself. Are you seeing the same thing? And what can I do to bring more of my strengths to the table to help support us? Right. Mm-hmm. If you walked in my door of my office saying that in a performance review, I'd be thrilled. I'd bend over backwards to help find how we can take those strengths that you've identified and maximize them further. And many of us don't realize, you know, we're the center of our own movie and our boss is in his own movie or her own movie. <laughs> and they can't see all the little nuances and all the things that are going on in our life. And it's very hard in managing a team to manage all of that. It gets exponentially harder. So the better prepared you are in those moments where you do get frank response and feedback from your boss or your peers even, the better it's going to be for you to double down on those strengths and grow into that role. The other opportunity you have in that conversation with your boss is to link your strengths to the achievement of the team's goals, the strategic goals, how you support revenue, innovation. And I tell our coaching clients, draw it clearly. Don't make your anybody guess. Just spell it out for me exactly how your strengths enabled us to achieve this goal. And this And by saying what you did does not mean you're not a team player or that you don't recognize that it takes a village. We all know it takes a team, but you need to be clear enough around your impact and how you drove the results as well as the contribution of the team. Because to your point, AJ, if I'm managing a team of three, five or 10 people, it's not possible for me to know everything you're doing and also to make all those connections. Just it isn't it isn't feasible. Do it for me. Make it easy for me to see what a rock star you are. 
Yeah. And, and those moments are key throughout the year. Again, and and so many of our coaching clients default to that performance review time. And that's when they raise their self-awareness. And that's when all the issues get presented. It's like, no, this has most likely been an ongoing issue. And if you could have nipped it in the bud originally with that conversation, or you could have clarified, hey, this is how my strength actually played into this result. It would have saved you the dreaded review, would have saved you the frustration of not getting promoted another year and feeling like you're falling behind. And so one tactical way to do this, to keep that performance conversation ongoing, is when you have your one-on-one with your manager. So let's say you meet with them twice a month intentionally carve out time at one of those, and maybe it's just 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes, and you come in strengths, you come in with feedback you're seeking, you come in with where you want to develop in the next two weeks, month. If you take ownership and bring that conversation to them, that will allow you to get more real-time feedback, and you're not going to miss an opportunity. And it shows that hunger, and I want to grow, and I want to be with the company, and I'm looking to move. Absolutely. And Another point that you make in the book that sort of all of this is drawn from is our relationships with our coworkers and our boss. And many of us take that relationship for granted. It's there because we're next to the people that we work with or we're on Zoom all the time now. And yeah, I have a relationship, but we don't do a great job of managing that relationship and allowing it to fully blossom. In fact, some of us bring negative assumptions into these relationships. And we're grilling our peers and holding them to standards that they can't meet. And in the process, we're sacrificing those relationships that we need to get ahead. How can we get off the ladder of interference, as you call it, and cultivate a healthier working environment? Oh, you brought up the ladder. This is a good one because we've all been up the ladder. So there's an event. AJ and I have a conversation and then it doesn't go the way I want it to. So then I step on the rug. I'm like, "Mm, yep, here's the story. He wasn't prepared. He wasn't ready to give me the feedback I want. Then I go up the next rung. I'm like, he's just not a good manager. He is not tuned in. Then I step on the next rung of the manager of the ladder and I look like "Mm, I'm going to think about the five last times I worked with him. Yep. He just sucks as a manager. Look at all these instances. And before you know it, I'm at the top of this thing called the ladder. And I've created this story based on one interaction about my manager, AJ, that isn't true. And the problem is now I'm going to act off of the story in my head. So the next time I see you act like an asshole because I have this story in my head. Now, the problem with the ladder twofold. One, we get to the top of it really quickly. And the reason it's called a ladder, and this is concept by Chris Argeris is the guy that came up with this. The ladder, top of a ladder is unstable. So it creates an unstable relationship. The other problem with it is you can get to the top of the ladder in like 30 seconds. It's so fast, really fast. And when you're already a little stressed and on edge and a little over zooming, it becomes a 15 second climb. Now, once you're there, how do you get off? So the first thing to do is you've got to go back to the event and focus on the facts. Facts are an actual occurrence, something observable, something you can see. What actually happened in the situation? Now, sometimes you can be pretty heated and it can be pretty hard to do that. So it can be helpful If there was a colleague or a peer, someone who's more neutral, either in that interaction saw it, or you can tell them what happened to help you see the facts of the situation to look at it. Then you've got to check the story. Yeah, the story I'm telling myself is he just doesn't care. He's a terrible manager. And can we look for instances where that wasn't true? So now we've got to bump our our story up against other facts. And then we've got to go back to that person because we've probably acted out and been a jerk. Go back to the original situation. Here's the story that I told myself. What was your experience? How can we find a mutually beneficial solution? There's so many key points that I want to (laughs) talk about there because I know so many of us and, and I've been on that ladder faster than 15 seconds. The first one is us bringing our own story to the plate. At the very beginning, we all of a sudden start mind reading 
and assuming these things about our coworkers, our peers, or our boss or manager that we have no factual relevance or, or evidence of whatsoever. Right. <laughs> and it's important in these moments that we remind ourselves how quickly we can fall into this trap and just raising awareness around that, that this is a common occurrence. You're not alone. We've all suffered it, especially when we've in a heat of the moment or we feel that we've been wronged in any way. And then the second piece to this that I think is, is so key, and it's something that I do in my life in the business with Johnny, I'm doing it and, and with Amy and my relationship around, let me just go through this story and see if you can see what I'm seeing or feeling. And please tell me, hey, that sounds like an opinion to me, or that sounds like you're reading too much into it. I need you to be that extra set of eyes and ears in this situation because my emotions are getting the best of me. It's short circuiting all of the logical information that our brain is processing and it's coloring the way, of course, we're going to react in the moment. And then also the worst part about this is we can carry that grudge for months, years, and it leads to our own prison of misery where your peers, your boss doesn't even know or have those feelings at all. And you're just carrying that weight for no reason. So having that peer, having that spouse, that partner, someone in your life that will be honest with you and say, you know what, that doesn't sound like the boss that I've encountered, or that sounds like you're reading too much into that story, or did they actually say that, or are you surmising that that's how they were feeling and what was going on for them? Just having that level of inquiry when you're sharing those heat of the moment stories has allowed me certainly to bring more clarity. And then the part that I, I really love, the last bit that you said there is then going circling back and being like, you know, I, I may have screwed up in my reading of this and this is how I was feeling in the moment. Does that check out for you? Because I certainly don't want to carry this forward. I don't want this level of conflict, frustration or whatever to be a part of my work environment. And we are responsible for the relationships in our job. We have control. We oftentimes pretend like we don't know oh, my boss is this way, so I just have to deal with it. You don't. You have more control than you want to believe. Mm -hmm. And you own a piece of the action. So if the relationship isn't working well, the first place you have to look is yourself. What's the story, as you said, that I'm telling myself? Where am I holding this grudge? Where am I allowing this grudge or this story to inform my behavior that isn't based in facts in the actual situation that we're in? Because until you own your piece of the action, that relationship is not going to change. We all know that People, we can't make people change. That, that yeah. doesn't work, but we can change. And what I've seen so often in our clients, and I would imagine you have as well, is when they finally have the conversation with their manager or their partner or that team member and can be vulnerable and open enough, really wanting to understand that perspective or what was going on, that's where the transformative breakthrough will happen. That's where they can really see differently and it will it will actually strengthen that relationship. So it can take a very fractured, contentious relationship to a place of mutual respect and understanding. That's exactly it. That shows that you appreciate that person enough to value the relationship and not let this ladder of interference lead you to think all of a sudden, oh my God, this person is out to get me. It becomes a magnifying glass and a spotlight for other behaviors. And, and I've been just as guilty of this. Then all of a sudden I'm in the break room and my coworkers are laughing. They could be laughing about a joke on TV, but I'm like, oh, they're laughing about me because I'm still holding that story from what happened in the meeting two weeks ago. And that's an awful place to be in your work environment. I think those are wonderful cognitive tools to to use to work your way through the the stories that you're telling yourself. I think also coming to grips and and being honest with yourself of where your strengths and weaknesses are and know when you are on your weaknesses and because that's where you're going to be the most emotive, you're frustrated, you're worn out, you're, you're, you know, you're coming up short and you're frustrated. And it, it's at that moment when you're, in those moments to recognize I'm, I'm outside of my comfort zone, my emotions are flying, therefore the stories that I'm gonna be telling myself about what is going on around me are, are going to probably a little bit more exaggerated than they normally are because I'm worked up emotionally. I think also making sure that you ground yourself 
my understanding is that for, for the most people want the best for each other and they, and they want you to succeed and you wouldn't have been hired and put in this, in this group in this role, if the person who hired you did not think you were going to be a good fit, either you will grow into that role or you're perfect for that role, but they're not going to want to put you in a role where you're going to fail. That makes them look bad. That makes the company do worse. And now the, the, the trauma that would, would be, that would come from something like that would affect your whole staff. And now your whole staff is dealing with the abuse and the trauma of the blowout that just happened. Absolutely. And I think we could also, Jenny, talk about this in terms of SCARF. I think this could be helpful to talk about that framework around sure. um, just the emotion and being worn down. So there is a framework and it's called SCARF. So all of us are social animals. We want to be in relationship. And interestingly, social pain is treated in our brain the same way as physical pain. Yeah. So when you are feeling like you're not good enough or you're not on the team, it is a painful situation. And there are five domains in SCARF. It's status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. And at work and in life, any, all, some, or all five of these can be triggered. And when they get triggered, it's exactly what you're talking about, Johnny. You are just overwhelmed in emotion. You want to either punch someone in the face because you're like, or you just want to take up your choice and yeah. be like, I'm out. Yeah. I'm out. I'm not playing in the sandbox anymore with you. I'm out of here. And so when you think about these five, status is about power and pecking order. Do I know where I fit in the group? Certainty is about knowing the outcome. Can I predict what's going to happen next? I'll feel comfortable. Autonomy, can I shape my work in a way that I have control and choice? Relatedness, I'm in the group. And then fairness, it feels fair. Just knowing that these are common, we all experience some we when when one of these is triggered having that emotional outburst is completely normal don't want to stay in it want to take a breath and step out and if possible think about what you could do to mitigate these so i'll give you a personal example autonomy is my big one mm -hmm. I need, I want to feel like I'm in control, love being an entrepreneur, self-directed. So as soon as I get the client that starts to get really prescriptive, really demanding, I can just feel it. It's like, well, my boxing gloves come up. I'm like, mm, that's not how we do it around here. And so I have to check myself. I'm like, okay, you're feeling this. This is an autonomy threat. You're feeling it. Take a breath. Okay, let's take a moment and then step back in. Or how can I mitigate it going forward and have a couple of things in our contract that are more non-negotiable that give that space and flexibility that I know I need and my team needs? I think the one time all of us feel that exact experience is when we have been passed over for a promotion. And this is a very common situation in, in many of our careers. We're going to face this adversity. And it definitely stinks in the moment. And unfortunately, in many of those situations, we're not given the feedback as to why. Someone else gets the promotion. They bring in someone outside or someone else who we thought was less qualified or all the story we bring to the table. And we never get that feedback. We never close that loop. What is your advice if you've been in that situation or you're experiencing it right now to combat all of those negative emotions that we know lead you up that ladder of inference and all of a sudden we're in a very toxic situation. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, you got to ride the wave of the emotion. So if you try to tap it down, it's going to come out. I mean, you're going to flip someone off in traffic. You all know it. If, so part of it is letting the emotion move through. So physical movement, dance party, humor, all of these can kind of help the emotion settle down because in that highly charged state right after they're like, so Joe is going to be taking this new position. You're not in any kind of state of mind to ask for specific feedback or do anything really rational. So just pause and back off. Right. <laughs> then the second step is we always talk about what do you know about the person that received that promotion? 
And what do you know about their experience? What do you know about their skills? What do you know about their track record? And can you step back? And this often works well with a partner or a teammate or a spouse and compare their resume, CV to yours? And can you see places where you're aligned? And do you see some gaps? Do they have a certification? Have they worked in this market segment, but you haven't? So can we get some grounded data just from what we know about this person? And then the second step is to feel the fear and go ask your manager. Because I would suggest being passed over When it is a true surprise, then your piece of the action is you weren't doing what you've said all along, AJ, getting that consistent feedback and check in. If it is a huge surprise, that's your piece of the action. We should have known there was a gap so you could have solved for it and not have been passed over. And then sometimes they're not, your manager won't give you specific feedback. And if that's the case, can you go to someone else in the company, a mentor, sponsor that might be able to give you some more feedback on what your opportunity is to ensure this doesn't happen again? I know for myself, when I get wound up, when I feel those emotions come on, I've, I've labeled it emotional theater which by labeling it that way, I'm able to detach and observe myself and the emotions, how I'm feeling. And I could laugh at it. I could be like, oh my God, what are you doing now? Because it is now labeled. It is something to see. It's a production. I'm, I'm, and it's going to go on whether or not I'm engaged. But by detaching myself, I could go through the emotions. I could even check in with myself going, are you, are you done yet? No, <laughs> no. No, not yet. No. <laughs> I'll need another night to sleep on it. And, and it, it allows me to feel, uh, observe, and act accordingly without getting caught up in it. Yes. And that's brilliant. And I'm so glad we're not talking about suppressing our emotions because it does not work. I, work, I tried that. It did not work. It just comes out in a really interesting or ugly way that none of us really want to talk about on exactly. a podcast. So we, we won't go there. Yeah. You, and I think it, it's so important just to give yourself what you're talking about, Johnny, that grace and space, be an observer, laugh at it, have fun with it, but let it be big, and bold. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, like do what it is, whatever it needs to do in a container, obviously, that doesn't harm you or anyone else. Uh, but you can just ride the wave because it will pass. It will pass. It will pass. And if you have documented a few times or honest with yourself about a few times that you acted through that emotion and you see the insanity and how you how you made everything <laughs> worse. Number one, you realize that acting in this moment, it's not going to help. That's, we understand that. Number two, just things will pass. And then when things calm down, you'll be able to work through it uh, in a, in a much more logical manner. And just by having that documented, you know that I know I'm fired up. I know this needs to be handled, but What's the big deal if I handle it now or I wait two, three days? And waiting those two or three days is going to make everything that much better. Even if it might need an answer in that moment, it's just going to be better if we just let things go, let things die down, detach, allow the show to go on, uh, have some fun watching it and have a giggle over yourself. And then, and then deal with what you need to do. The world's not going to end in in two days. No. (laughs) Switching gears a little bit here. There are many in our audience and and I'm thinking of a recent client who joined us in our X Factor group who sought feedback and sought feedback from his peers and got the 360 review that we've discussed. And one of the bits of feedback that he got is that he's actually terrible at giving feedback. And when he gives feedback, it's actually demotivating. And one of the all-stars on the team, one of their recent hires, did was struggling and, and trying to do everything. And in trying to do everything, they, they didn't do the one main piece that they really needed to do for the group to succeed. So he gave that bit of feedback and it was poorly received and, and demotivated this new guy so much that he actually thought about quitting because he had 
so much respect for our client and to get that feedback made him feel like he was doing such a horrible job he didn't deserve to be there. So talking about the ladder of inference working the other way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Many of us now are moving into management roles and soft skills is obviously what we talk about on the show. And it's a, a big part of your success in your career. And part of that is is giving others feedback and not demotivating those that you are working beneath you. What are your tips and strategies for, for imparting that effective feedback and keeping motivation high on our teams? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to start, AJ, with a not to do. Okay. And it's the feedback sandwich. This is what you're doing so well. And then I'm going to bury the thing you need to work in right here. I'm going to say it really quick. And then this is what you're doing really, really well. And the problem with the feedback sandwich is you're burying my opportunity. And so I'm unclear on what it is I need to focus on. But the story we tell ourselves is it's motivating because I gave two positives for one opportunity. Doesn't work. So We want to keep the motivation up. So the first thing is to be specific and very action oriented. So the feedback focuses once again on the facts, what's observable, what we can quantify. And it's one little piece. You do not throw the entire kitchen sink. It's just one little piece with a very specific action step of what to do differently. And then it's framed The container of the feedback to maintain that motivation is about growth, development, and performance. AJ, I know you want to be our next VP of sales. And one of the things our VP of sales does really well is understanding clients' pain points. In the last conversation with a client, I observed you did not ask a specific question about their market segment. Specific questions give us really important data. In your next conversation, ask a specific question. This is one thing our VP of sales does really well. That's a totally different conversation. Absolutely. And now it is completely on the mark for me to go and execute on. Yes, you can do it. That's the problem with the sandwich. That's the the problem with the sandwich. (laughs) (laughs) Your belly's full. You have no idea what you actually need to do next. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. But many of us are trying to save feeling, save face, not give the feedback for fear that it won't be absorbed properly. And we're actually doing a disservice to that person because we're muddling the message. They can't act on it. They can't improve. And then we're continuing to hold them to a high standard with no clarity. Right. You haven't set them up for success. And feedback can be an emotionally neutral event if it's specific based on the facts. You give an example of the behavior that is going to support them in achieving their career goals. It doesn't have to trigger a fight or flight response. It doesn't have to send us into this emotional vortex. It's, and also, if you as a manager are coming in scared, nervous, well, that's going to come through. You know, so you might need, if, you, if you're new to management, maybe you're first time leading a team, your opportunity might be practice with a peer. Hey, I, this is my first time. I'd like to practice. Here's what I want to say. Can you give me some feedback on this? Because rehearsal will also help dial down that emotion. You know, when you do it a couple of times, when you do it with a person, it's going to feel, oh, I know what I'm doing. I've practiced this. Yeah. And I think involving that other person is so key. It's the same experience I do when I'm practicing speaking on stage. Doing it in an empty room is so different than even having one person sitting in front of you. So if you're going to be practicing feedback or conversations or interviews or anything for career advancement, involve another human in it. Don't just do it in your bathroom, do it in your room without that response, because it's a totally different experience when someone is in the room reacting in a way that you hadn't encountered, you hadn't prepped for. One other asterisk I want to make to that, because I 100 percent agree and set the person that you're partnering with, who is your audience or who is role-playing for an interview, set them up with what the feedback is that you want. So it could be you have on a sheet, please listen for these four things, or please note my eye contact. Because you don't want to set your feedback provider up to just open the can of worms. They're like, well, you know, you were twitching your hair. (laughs) I don't care about my hair. I, that was right. not what I was about, you know, but so we want to make sure once again, that's really specific. To come back just to this, this is great. So in our classrooms, we did, we used to do video work and 
we would film our clients interacting with others so we could give them some constructive feedback because when you're nervous, there are certain uh, tells and fundamentals that will break down that you can easily point to. And we have a lot of fun with it and everyone's quite surprised at some of the things that they see in themselves when they get nervous. But it never fails. At the end of the day, there's always one or two people go, hey, that was great. Can I have my video? And we always tell them no. And the reason being is that we know what they're going to do with that video. They're going to end up, they're already doing it whether you give them the video or not, but they're playing what they've seen or the video on a loop. And then they just start nitpicking all of these things that is not adding uh, to the message that they want to get across and they're focusing on on the wrong things and then before you know it because they've ripped themselves to shreds they are absolutely frozen mm -hmm. they can't perform yep absolutely it's the, it's the sweater thread <laughs> It is, which is why when we think about performance in any context, it's just focusing on one thing you want to get better on. I love that. The other, it's always difficult to perform these things in front of people. And you, you don't, roping in one of your friends to watch you, you're going to rationalize it of, well, they don't count and, and, and they're not looking at the right things. And, but in, but if you're able to give them something to focus on, as you mentioned, that is the best way that you're going to prepare. And, and as you said, preparing in front of the mirror and then having to walk into that room at, where there's a table full of folks looking at you, is it's not good. You haven't practiced for that, for that room of those people. You practiced for yourself in that mirror and you did what you needed to to get through that, but you haven't prepped for that room. And so having a friend, having two friends and then giving them something, here's what I need you to focus on because this is what I'm working on. That's, that's wonderful. The other thing you can do um, is how do we dial up your discomfort? You know, how, how do we push, we, we talked about in running, like how do you push the pain threshold out there, but how do you create low risk situations there where you can feel that discomfort of eight set of eyes looking at you across the table in an interview situation, just so you can practice a little bit of that feeling and sit with it enough to realize that you're going to keep it together. This is too, is going to be okay. But if you can find situations that you can put yourself in that just give you a little bit of that, this feels scary. This feels hard. Okay. I'm going to sit with it for just a little bit and see how long I can hold it. Yeah, that is what we call our comfort zone challenges in our courses. And it's exactly that. It's it's fun, low stakes way for you to feel discomfort. It doesn't impact your career, doesn't mm -hmm. impact your current no. relationships. But you have to get comfortable with that feeling of discomfort because it is going to be a pattern. It is that wall between you and the things you want in life, whether it's getting up on stage, whether it's a job interview or the last piece that I wanted to touch on that is, is so key to many in our career, seeking mentorship. And many of the students that we talk to are afraid to ask people to mentor them. They think it's a massive responsibility. They don't know how to go about it. And unfortunately, they're missing out on key opportunities for career advancement because not only are these mentors there ready to help support you, but a lot of the valuable feedback that you're not getting from your bosses or you can't get from your peers, you're going to be able to receive from a mentor who's taking a little bit more time investing in you personally. So... When it comes to your clients who are seeking mentorship, what are some of the tips or strategies that our listeners can use to find and, and really land that mentorship that's going to help them get ahead? So first, identify the right person, which I know you coach your clients on. So is it a thought leader? Is it someone who has the position? Is it someone who's overcome the challenge you're working to overcome? So we need to find the person who has a demonstrated track record of success in the area that you want to perform in. So we find the right person. Secondly, tell yourself they're really excited to talk about themselves. We all love talking about ourselves. So do not have the story that they do not want to share their insight and wisdom because they probably do want to share. And the third thing is you've got to do the work. So people, mentors, the folks that we talk to for, uh, who want to be mentors, one thing that they always talk about is the time, you know, time capacity. And so 
they want to contribute, they want to support folks, but they need the mentee to do the work. That means coming prepared with a set of questions. That means you seeking them out. That means you adjusting your schedule and making it work. Maybe it's a 15 minute quick connect in transit with this person on the phone, but you've got to own that relationship. It is not your mentor's responsibility to own it you need to own it. And the other thing that we hear from our mentors is the last lack of specificity. So if it's too open or too ambiguous, and I'm not exactly sure how I could be in service, that does not feel good for a mentor. And that goes back to that clarity around why you chose this person and what you're looking to learn, gain, grow, or develop in and with this relationship. And do you, there is one other point here. There's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. Right. You want to break that down for our audience as well? (laughs) Okay. So a sponsor is someone internally in your organization who advocates on behalf of your career. They're the one who says when the doors are closed and you're not there, hey, have you thought about Johnny for this stretch assignment? I worked with him or I know he's capable in these three areas. So they are your internal PR. They are advocating for you throughout the organization. They can only advocate if they know you and your work. So you have to make sure you're you're clear on that. Mentor is about development, growth, advice, uh, career counseling. A mentor doesn't have to be in your organization and sometimes and often not times is not the same as your sponsor. Right. Very important point. And I think the two areas uh, of weakness that I've experienced in this mentor-mentee relationship is the lack of specificity up front. And it always starts with, can I pick your brain? (laughs) Well, you know, and we laugh about that, but, you know, many fresh out of college, they they come in not having that specificity and they just expect, okay, well, it's just 15 minutes of so-and-so's time. It can't be that big of a deal. But if it's that nebulous, if it's that broad, that 15 minutes can feel like two hours and the mentor, potential mentor is going to pass on it. And the second thing is start small. Take the 15 minutes that you get. Don't ask for three hours in an in-person meeting. Take the 15 minutes. And then the follow-up I found is just absolutely key because no one wants to give advice and, and not hear if the advice worked or not get any response back. Was it beneficial? Am I helping this person? I don't know. So any action items that you take from that initial meeting or the the uh, feedback that you receive from the mentor, circle back in a timely manner and say, I did this and X, Y, Z happened. Even if it's small, that is going to show the mentor or the person who potentially you could mentor you that you are someone who's going to proactively utilize the time spent together in a way that's meaningful for both parties. Yes, I love talking about myself, but I love hearing how my lessons have helped transform someone else's career even more. If I'm just talking about myself, well, I could hit record on the podcast and do that. So that that circle back of the information and the results, I find often lacking in, in people who approach me. Hey, can you mentor me? And you're right. People are very open to it but only for a short amount of time. If I keep giving advice and I don't see any of it going anywhere and there hasn't been any changes or even worse, you say, oh, I'm going to get to that this week. And then weeks go by, no response. Well, it's going to make me less encouraged to continue the relationship. And it's really important to manage those expectations up front. Well, and I think sometimes as mentees, we forget that um, the mentor's brand is also at stake here too. Back to your point, AJ, I want to help you. I want you to grow. And I, I want to see that. Um, and if it's not happening, that ha- that could have a negative impact on my brand potentially, if particularly if we're internal in organization and you've been very public, yeah. AJ's my mentor and I'm still floundering on the thing that I went to him to help me <laughs> with. <laughs> right. right. Doesn't, doesn't look good for either of us. <laughs> Now, we love ending every episode with a challenge for our audience. I know we hit them with a lot of great tips and advice. Is there one thing that you would challenge our audience to do in the next week that you think could really help advance their career or or turn their job that they dread into a job that gives them purpose and fulfills them? I would challenge your audience to get really clear on how your work is important and valuable to your customer either internal or external. So if you and this work did not exist, what would happen? That is such a 
valuable exercise. And we aren't just cogs in a machine. We are a very important part of what's going on. And the clearer we are on that, the easier it is for all of that purpose and fulfillment from work to spring forward. Our last question today, we ask of all of our guests, what is your X factor? What do you think makes you unique, combining a skill set and a mindset that has unlocked success for you in your life? I am intensely curious about what makes people tick. And in understanding that, I learn more about myself and can help them. And we definitely found that in your latest book. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Where can our audience find out more about the work that you do? I'm CarsonTate.com and on LinkedIn, Carson Tate. And check out the book on any of your favorite retailers. Own it, love it, make it work. Thank you so much, Carson. Thank you, Carson. Thanks.